every voice and sing to let them
lift every voice and sing to let them With the steady beat, have not a weary feet. Come to the place for which our parents sighed. Oh, how they sighed. We have come over a way that with tears has been won. From the gloomy past till now we stand at last where the light gleams of the bright star bright star is past the past of its is to introduce to you our lift every voice
Thank you for tuning in to our today. We hope that you see or hear something that will help you understand how important Black history is for the young, the old, for all race to learn or remember our history. Carter G. Woodson stated that real education means to inspire people to live more abundantly, to learn to begin with life as they find it and make it better. We hope this program makes you better. We hope you enjoy what we have uh, to share today. Our keynote speaker from for the evening, and it is my honor, my privilege, my pleasure to introduce my friend and brother to you, Marcus Marshall. Marcus is the son of a preacher, uh, the son of an educator. So what he brings on tonight is he brings both scholarship and theology, a grounding in both spaces. And I promise you, you're going to be blessed by him. What Marcus is going to do is unique is that he is going to narrate for us uh, from our beginnings as a people all the way up to our present day. And so he's going to take us on a journey. Listen, this is not Harriet Tubman freeing, Harriet Tubman freeing the slaves. This is not cookies and punch. This is not just Dr. King's I have a dream speech. As a matter of fact, he really is not going to talk any at all about Dr. King much. He really is digging deep and taking us on a deep dive into understanding our culture, our history, and our heritage. Things you have never heard before, you may have never understood, but it's critical to understanding who we are as a people. And so sit back, enjoy. Actually, I tell you, take out a notepad and a pencil to be able to jot this stuff down and remember it well. I was blessed myself the first time that I heard Marcus share a similar uh, dialogue as this was at the school he was a principal of. I'm telling you, I was blown away. I was sitting back and I walked away saying to myself, I am better because I spent this time on today. So listen, enjoy it. Turn off the TV, don't have any distractions, but you are going to be blessed by the gifting and intelligence and brilliance of Marcus Marshall as he navigates us through the history, our black history. Start our exploration of black history in ancient Kemet. We'll examine the West African empires. We'll look at the Ma'afa, the New World, experience the black nadir, move through the civil rights movement into the present day. In any intellectual pursuit, one must start at the beginning. And that is exactly what we will do. When does the African experience begin? 
approximately 5,000 years ago in 3150, ancient Egypt became officially uh, is recognized as a civilization. The word Egypt is actually an exonym. The people who lived in that area did not call it Egypt. They referred to it as Kemet, K-M-T. You can see the Nile River running from uh, into the Mediterranean Sea. Ancient Kemet meant land of the blacks. The Nile River was instrumental to life there. The, the regular flooding enabled agriculture. Kemet was urban, it was multicultural and multiracial. It was urban, multicultural and multiracial. The people of Kemet interacted with uh, the neighboring empires. At times, Agent Kemet would be on top, the Egyptian, and then other times, the other peoples would actually dominate over the Egyptians, such as the people of the Kingdom of Kush. And clearly we can see from their own artwork what they perceived and how they perceived themselves. These were not people of Caucasoid descent. Kush is very important. They were warriors, but they were international traders. As you can see, uh, Kush was in modern day Sudan. You can see Ethiopia to the southeast. And of course, Egypt would be to the north. Very important because of the many contributions that they would make and made to civilization. We can see the influence of the Egyptians on the, uh, at the city of Moreau, the pyramids. Moreau was a city in Kush. Eastern African empires and civilizations. Staying in the Northeast, we see uh, the Kingdom of Aksum. It's in modern day Ethiopia. Again, these were people who knew how to fight, but they were international traders. We see the Royal Tomb of Izana. Izana was one of the more uh, significant rulers. We saw that Stele, and these are the achievements of the people of Aksum. They were Christians and they spread Christianity. The Indian maritime trade. The people of Africa were interacting with India via trade before the Europeans came onto the scene. And we see an example of the type of uh, boat that they were using, which is impressive. This gives rise to Swahili. Swahili is going to be a mixture of Bantu and some Arabic uh, words. So it became a, 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 lingua, a lingua fraca, a common language. There are significant accomplishments and peoples in the south of Africa, southern Africa, the great Zimbabwe. Most of Africa is a savanna, it's not a jungle, grasslands. So having a city required having walls and having fortresses. fortresses. So we see uh, how this city was constructed and we see how uh, fortified it was. And we see uh, the Mutapa Empire, one of the last major empires in Africa before European conquest. So what was Europe doing during this golden age that the Africans were experiencing across the continent? Uh, the fall of Rome in 476 AD led to a, what's called a dark age in Rome, in, excuse me, in Europe, uh, also known as the medieval period. There is extreme poverty, there's illiteracy, the people are superstitious, and there is very little innovation at this time. The Moors, African Muslims of the Maghreb, which is northern Africa, they preserved classical knowledge uh, of the Indians, of the Chinese, of the, uh, of, of the Arabic people, of Rome and of Greece and of Egypt. And they basically shared it with the Europeans. They built major universities in Europe, uh, multiple universities in Europe, and they enabled the portion of Europe that they controlled, which is essentially Spain, they enabled it to flourish, they empowered it to flourish, while the rest of Europe was mired in ignorance and paganism. As we transition to Western Africa, there's a very important trade between West Africa and Northern Africa. It's called the gold salt trade. Gold was abundant in Western Africa. Gold, diamonds, uh, other natural resources and precious metals. It was traded for salt. Now, some people might ask, why would one trade gold for salt? Because we understand the value of gold. But salt was just as important because it was used as a preservative. 
before refrigeration, salt was the primary way to preserve meat. So the value of salt was very high. If a person killed an animal and did not, and was not able to preserve it within a few hours of it dying, or killing it rather, it would be no good and it would spoil. So that's the value of salt. So gold is flowing from Western Africa into Northern Africa and the rest of the world. And salt is flowing from Northern Africa, the desert, into West Africa. This trade is very important and will be instrumental in some very significant events in the future. So we're talking about 400 to approximately 1200 AD. The first major empire is gonna be Ghana, Western Africa, part of the gold salt trade. The Ghana Empire is gonna be replaced by another empire, which it will be a little bit larger, called the Mali Empire. And Mali uh, is where the home of Timbuktu, if you've ever heard the name of that city before, that's a real place. And we see Mali was slightly larger than Ghana. And here are some examples of the architecture. These buildings still stand today. There were a number of universities and major libraries in Timbuktu. Mansa Musa is a very important historical figure. At this time, the people, many of the people in West Africa were Muslim. And so part of the Islamic or the Muslim faith requires one to make a pilgrimage or hajj to the Arabian Peninsula, to the city of Mecca. Now, Mansa Musa, again, we said that gold was abundant. Mansa Musa gave away so much gold in his hajj. He gave away so much gold there to Mecca and back to his home in Mali, that the international value of gold fell for about a decade after his hajj. So he destabilized the, the value and the price of gold for the better part of 10 or 11 years because he gave away so much gold. This hajj would draw attention to Africa by Europeans and it would begin the, or be one of the initiating factors to the conquest of Africa by Europeans. So wealth, material wealth, mineral wealth was abundant in Africa. And Mansa Musa's Hajj garnered the attention of Europeans and they would shortly begin their exploration. And then the final major West African empire, uh, the Sangay Empire, again, general vicinity of the Mali and Ghana, Again, the gold salt trade is in full effect, and we can see the years of its existence, 1464, about 1591. And there's one other, the Benin, Benin Empire, again, 1500 to about 1900. We can see some examples of the uh, ornamentation. So what were Europeans doing at the global level they were beginning to explore or exploit. It depends on your perspective. And we'll see momentarily what that looks like. So, as you can see, all of these are different kingdoms or different peoples. They do not view themselves as African. That is a modern day construct. There are several labor systems in Africa and slavery did exist, but slavery means and meant different things at different times to different people in history. Anyone who lost a war uh, years ago became a slave. There's a labor system called peonage. Peonage, basically, think about sh uh, sharecropping or serfdom. People are so poor that they're essentially tied to the land. There's pawnship. Pawnship essentially looked like a person who had to work off their debt uh, there were some arrangements, it varied. There were some arrangements where a person would get up and do work and then come back home and then get up and do work for the person that they owed and come back home. It sounds a lot like a job. And then we have uh, chattel slavery. Chattel is gonna be the most severe and we're gonna see chattel slavery primarily in the Americas. Chattel slavery is rare in Africa. Uh, it did exist in antiquity 
but most places did not treat their slaves with the brutality that we are going to examine and explore in the new world. And so we see participants of the slave trade. Slavery as a term has evolved and means and meant different things at different times. So when you hear the word slavery, don't automatically assume it's about picking cotton sun up to sundown. That's not what it's necessarily about. Not even for our people who were enslaved in the Americas. And we're going to see that more closely momentarily. The Maafa, or the Middle Passage, uh, the worst Africans who were instrumental in the transportation of enslaved Africans from Africa to the New World was dangerous, uh, diseased, circumstances were, were dank, uh, disturbing, and depressing. Think, if you can imagine and conjure up in your mind the most disturbing way to travel or even live, then you can basically kind of wrap your mind around what a slave ship was like. As you can, as you can see, people were packed in. Every human Bodily fluid was present. Every human bodily fluid. Whether you were sick, whether you had to urinate, whether you had to defecate, whether you had to menstruate. Now these ships were, they were arranged to maximize the cargo. As you can see, based on the image, that was something called the coffin position. They were packed in as tightly as possible to maximize the profit. Slavery was not just about, enslavement was not just about hatred. It was about economic exploitation. The number of people who perished from Africa to the New World is estimated to be between 30 to 60 million people perished and did not make it. And the circumstances were so poor and so the casualties were so high the sharks actually followed these ships across the Atlantic Ocean because they knew that by following these ships, they were guaranteed to satisfy their hunger. We see the triangle trade. Enslaved Africans go to the New World where they uh, assist in making finished goods and products to be shipped back to Europe. Here's a list of the European nations in order, chronological order, of when they were on top or dominated Africa, if you will, the international trade, Portuguese to Dutch, etc. Now, why was American chattel enslavement so brutal? There were several lies that were told by Europeans. And if one looks at the early encounters between Europeans and Africans, they will see a change in the language and a change in the way that they talk about and talk at African royalty. But there are several major stereotypes that begin to uh, circulate and they still exist today. And that is Africans as savages or bestial, animalistic. Africans as lazy or shiftless. They still exist today, these stereotypes. Africans as infantile, simple-minded, stupid. Africans as overly sexual, Jezebels and rapists. And Africa, the continent, as a corrupting force or adventure. If you pay very close attention to any cartoon, any commercial, any movie, any book, you will see one, if not all, of these stereotypes. These stereotypes have endured the test of time. They are equally false today. They are equally damaging today as they were then. The very first slave auction was in New York City. As you can see, there are brands as chattel. Chattel essentially means property. You are treated as such. Was cotton the primary cash crop? No, cotton was not always, as they say, king. There were other, more significant crops initially. It's not going to be until 1793 with the invention of the cotton gin, a device that quickly separates the cotton seed from the cotton 
uh, that cotton is going to rise and we're going to see a shift in the economics of enslavement. Enslaved Africans mostly worked in groups in the fields? False. Enslavement evolved in this country. In the early years of enslavement in this country, the enslaved Africans were more or less taught a trade. They became carpenters, blacksmiths, cobblers, made shoes. They became coopers, made barrels. They had some type of trade, if you will, because most families only had one enslaved African one or two. It is not going to be until about 1793 with the invention of the cotton gin that we're going to see gang labor and that is working sun up to sundown, picking cotton. But the existence of enslaved Africans was not always like that. So as the economic realities changed, so did the brutality of enslavement and so did the very nature of enslavement. Africans rarely resisted. This is untrue. How many slave revolts have you heard about? There were hundreds of rebellions and revolts. But there were multiple ways to resist. Feigning illness, sabotaging tools, breaking stuff, marooning to safety, simply meaning leaving and deserting. And there was also armed resistance. Here's a list of some of the major rebellions and revolts. Stono, of course, the Haitian Revolution. Haiti gained its independence. The Gabriel Prosser, then Marguisi, Nat Turner, and then the Amistad. Now, when the Civil War ends in April of 1865, just a few months later, we're going to see some changes in laws do note that exploitation did not end with the Civil War. Exclusion of African Americans did not end at the conclusion of enslavement, slavery, or the Civil War. It's important to know Lincoln is credited with emancipating African Americans, but he really didn't do anything to the uh, consistent with that. If you read the Emancipation Proclamation carefully, he freed the slaves who were not under his control. So the states in red is where he declared they were freed. The southern states that were that sympathized with the north, uh, such as Missouri, Kentucky, and parts of Tennessee, the declaration did not apply there, even though they had slaves. So it was nothing but a talking point. He didn't free anyone with the Emancipation Proclamation because he had no control over the Southern states at that time. It's important to know that slavery is still legal in this country and it's right in the 13th Amendment. It says neither slavery nor involuntary servitude except as punishment. So when a person is incarcerated, they can legally be enslaved. The new laws that sprang up are known as Jim Crow, Black Codes or Vagrancy Laws. And the laws were as follows. It said that blacks could not travel freely. Blacks could not assemble without permission. They could not own weapons. They could not intermarry with whites. And they had to have a job. What does that sound like to you? All of the decisions of a free person were taken away from the freedmen, the newly freed, uh, formerly enslaved African Americans. It is at this point that we enter into what is called the Black Nadir. From 1880 until 1920, a nadir is a low point, a point of great adversity or despair. This is a very uh, unique time period because there were a number of victories that people of color enjoyed, but there were some very hostile realities that still existed in this country for black people. In the Black Nadir, one of the lasting, most traumatizing and evil and brutal uh, parts of the legacy of this time period is going to be the lynching event. In the South, a person was lynched, a black person was lynched about every 3.6 days. So right around twice a week, there was a lynching. Over 3,000 documented lynchings. It was more than a hanging. It was a public display, display of barbarism. It was brutal. And there were homoerotic undertones, as you can see. 
the people who, the blacks, men primarily, but women as well, who were lynched, were put on public display. They were humiliated. They were tortured. Their limbs, teeth, uh, genitalia were cut off and taken as souvenirs and passed around and are still in the possession, no doubt, of some white Americans today. And then they were typically burned at the stake. So in the movies, they typically show a lynching as a single event. But a lynching could take place over the course of a day or hours. They occurred in the North and the South. A number of race riots also occurred during this time period. Virtually every city and town in this country has had some type of race conflict, including in Colombia, I believe in the 1940s. So we have here, again, in the midst of the black nadir, slavery by another name. Though enslavement officially ended in 1865, a new labor system is going to arise. It is called the convict lease system. And if you've seen the movie Life, then you have an idea of what I'm talking about. So the black men were arrested on false charges or trumped up charges, and then they were given long was about economics. It was an economic institution as well as a racist one. And then in the 1980s, you know about the crack epidemic, crack epidemic and the harsh laws that were directed towards African Americans to fill the prisons. America has more people in prisons than any other country in the world, and it's not even close. Why? Because free labor has been at the core of this country since the first Africans arrived here more than 400 years ago. Rising out of slavery, African Americans still accomplished more with less. Our ancestors were accomplished, they were bold, and they were resilient. They maximized every resource at their disposal for their betterment of themselves and their people. Here's a list of just a few highly important Industrious African Americans. These are inventors, these are physicians, these are attorneys, these are entrepreneurs. These are people who uh, transformed this country, not just for black people, but white people were actually the beneficiaries of their efforts. And here we have a number of bastions of black success around the country. And you see, you, can, you may notice some places. You see Black Wall Street in Tulsa, Sweet Auburn in Atlanta, Mound Bayou, Mississippi, and a number of other places around the country where centers of black growth, black renaissance, black opportunities. Certain jobs provided an insulated African Americans from white oppression more than others. Being self-employed was very important. If you had your own business, you did not rely on white people per se. If you happened to have a federal government job, you had a degree of protection, teachers, principals as well, but especially the black preacher and the black church. The black church has been the backbone of the social, and spiritual, and even the political uh, existence of black people in this country because it had a measure of independence. We have Booker T. Washington, Mary McLeod Bethune, and Ida B. Wells Barnett. Three tremendous figures. Ida B. Wells Barnett hailing from Memphis, Tennessee. She was truly a hero. She advocated against lynching both nationally and internationally. And she fought against segregation well over 120 years ago. She was actually banished from the South because she was so outspoken regarding the mistreatment of black people in this country. Very impressive woman, and there are many. Mary Shad Carey, more than 200 years ago, right around 200 years ago. She was the first black woman to publish a newspaper. She founded an interracial school, and she earned a law degree. She did this at, the, at a time when most people, not just women, not just black women, when most people could not, when many people could not read and write, and did not matriculate the college level. She was truly be, uh, beyond and before her time, as was Mary Church Terrell, Virginia Burns Hope, Anna Julia Cooper, 
Ida B. Wells Barnett, Septa McClark, and Mojeska Simpkins. Many of these women were pioneers and trailblazers, uh, and they made significant contributions to the uplift of the African American family. We have uh, Henry McNeil Turner, a significant African American. He was a, a chaplain in the military, and he was a black nationalist. I emphasize that because everybody in the past wasn't holding hands and singing Kumbaya. People such as, such as Asa Philip Randolph, Benjamin Mays, W.E.B. Du Bois, Booker T. Washington. And we have the black organizations that arise during or just after, well, during the Black Nadir. The National Association of Colored Women's Clubs was founded in 1896, as I mentioned previously. Advocates such as Mary Church Terrell and many others in the D.C. area were organizing and they were trying to uplift and organize for the betterment of the black family as it pertains to social realities and uh, economic and educational opportunities for children. So they started schools, uh, they built clinics, etc. Many of the women who were participant in this, the NACW, NACWC were, would later become the founders of the AKAs and the uh, Delta Sigma Theta. And of course, we know the NAACP, but the Brotherhood of Sleeping Car Porters, uh, we may not know as much about. This is going to be an organization that Asa Philip Randolph headed. It gave African Americans a union that they could participate in, and it helped organize and fight for equality, economic equality. Asa Philip Randolph was one of the, came from a family of men and women who didn't, who were not holding hands and believed in singing Kumbaya in the face of violence. As a young boy, the KKK on some type of mission or acting up in where he grew up and his father was sat on the porch with his shotgun ready for any or and everyone who would come to try to do his family harm. The Civil Rights Movement officially kicks off in 1955 with the murder and death of Emmett Till. Emmett Till lived in Chicago. His grandparents lived in Mississippi. It was alleged that he disrespected a white woman, and this is the brutality and torture and, and murder that resulted because of this false allegation. Typically, white women or the insult of a white woman was used to justify a lynching, torture, or murder of a black man, as we see here. He was only 14. Uh, he was sexually mutilated, as I referenced before. Lynchings had a homoerotic undertone. There are many unsung heroes in the movement. Dr. Vernon Johns was a tremendous minister. He's considered to be one of the most important, one of the premier ministers of the 20th century. He spoke multiple languages. He was a scholar. His rhetoric and sermons prepared the people in Montgomery for Dr. Martin Luther King, who would come when uh, Dr. Vernon Johns left the congregation there in Montgomery. So he prepared and prepped the people to receive Dr. Martin Luther King. And as we see here, the women there in uh, Montgomery were organizing before Dr. King arrived. So the WPC, the Women's Political Council, was very active. And here are some everyday people in Unsung Heroes, Amzie Moore and Fannie Lou Hamer. In this time period, it was unsafe for an African-American to just travel around uh, between states or even between cities within a state so you had to have a green book in other words you had to know exactly where there were black hotels black restaurants black gas stations and you had to plan your trip accordingly MZ Moore had owned one of the only gas stations and stores uh, in Mississippi between Memphis I believe and Vicksburg M.Z. Moore is important because he is a World War II veteran and World War II has a prominent role in the civil rights movement because a number of veterans who 
came back from fighting the war who had risked their lives were disappointed and concerned and motivated to the point of action as they saw the injustice that their people experienced here. In other words, there were many people, veterans, who asked themselves, what was the value of me fighting for this country if this country would not even accept me uh, and treat me fairly? And M.C. Moore was one of those veterans. He also owned, he was an entrepreneur, he owned a gas station and a store, and one of the only ones between Memphis and Vicksburg. So again, remember, in this time period, African Americans had to chart their interstate and intrastate travels very carefully so that they did not come into a situation where they were not going to have lodging, gasoline, or food, or whatever the case may be, or protection even. There were, in, there were what were called sundown towns, meaning that there were places where African Americans had to be out of the town before the sun went down. And then there's Fannie Lou Hamer. Fannie Lou Hamer is also a Mississippian. She was an activist. She was not college educated as many activists were, but she risked her life for the movement. She was beaten so severely on one occasion that she swole up and her skin was as hard as a football, as leather as they say. Uh, and she walked with a permanent limp and had recurring headaches for the rest of her life. So the people who agitated and fought for equality were murdered, they were brutalized, they were beaten. So again, the characteristics of enslavement, the, the brutality and violence did not end with slavery. And here are a few of the major civil rights organizations. We have CORE, SCLC, and SNCC. These were the primary drivers, organizations that were fighting for equality. Now, who is the most important civil rights figure and arguably one of the most important Americans of the 20th century? None other than Ella Jo Baker. Here's why she's so important. In the 1940s, she traveled around the South planting NAACP branches. It was dangerous and it could be deadly to be affiliated with the NAACP in this time period. But she went around and did the work of starting chapters in the 1930s and 40s. Fast forward to the late 50s, early 60s, and she's going to work and be instrumental working with Dr. King in the SELC. In fact, she was instrumental in one of the most, or the most successful program of the SELC, of Dr. King's organization, and that was the Citizenship School. It is in these classes that African Americans were trained with knowledge about the Constitution, about voting, about their rights, and also trained to uh, peacefully deal with the violence that would be directed toward them by white Americans. And then, a few years later, she would be one of the major influences or inspirations for SNCC, Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee. And these are the young people who are going to engage in the freedom rides, engage in the sit-ins, uh, and uh, Mississippi Freedom Summer. So these are going to be the young people who are putting their lives on the line, people such as John Lewis, uh, Jim Bevel, uh, and, and so on and so forth. One of the most important people that uh, Americans and many Americans have never heard of. She did tremendous things, did a tremendous work, and we owe her uh, our gratitude. It is an honor to have her uh, as one of our own. She dedicated her entire life to the struggle. And now we transition to some modern day achievements. We have Thurgood Marshall becoming the first Supreme Court Justice Edward Brooke, the first African American senator who was elected in the 20th century. We have Bradley, uh, we have Maynard Jackson and Coleman Young becoming mayors of Detroit, of Los Angeles, rather, Atlanta and Detroit. We have Shirley Chisholm. We have Shirley Chisholm being elected to Congress. 
We have Douglas Wilder being elected to the governorship. We have Carolyn Mosley Braun being elected to uh, the Senate. And we have our first black president just a few years ago, Barack Hussein Obama. And we see his family as well. And just a few months ago, we experienced and are overjoyed at the fact that we have our first female and first black vice president, Kamala Harris. Many have sacrificed, many have suffered, many have worked diligently to position our people for success. Never let someone tell you that nothing good came from Africa. We have a rich history that goes beyond enslavement. We were the authors of science. We were the authors of uh, recording history, hieroglyphics. We were the authors of uh, international trade. We engaged in everything that every other major civilization and empire engaged in. Be proud of your history. It is your history. And I know he watches, I know. Good evening, church. Tonight I want to start off with a prayer, so please bow your heads. Dear God, thank you for this day and everything that you've given us. Please help the poor and the sick and the children in the hospital. And dear Lord, I hope everybody makes it home safely tonight. And I hope everybody is doing well and feeling well for your COVID. And dear Lord, I hope everybody enjoys the Black History program that the church has prepared for us. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. Thank you, Kavoris, for the welcome, and thank you, Trayson, for the prayer. Uh, we do this program each year at Carmack in hopes that our students will learn about our, our Black history. And for some of us who don't know, we get to learn as well, or some that can remember our Black history. Uh, some of our Carmack students have agreed to be a part, and we want to thank them for their efforts. So next, next up, we will have Layla giving an autobiography of Ella Josephine Baker. We will have Dechelle, who will be giving a biography of Mary Bethune. Ashley, who will be giving us a poem by Lucille Clifton. And then Braxton, who will be giving us a biography of Fritz Polly. Thank you. the most important African-American leaders of the 20th century and perhaps the most influential woman in the civil rights movement. Ella Baker was an activist whose remarkable career spanned 50 years and touched thousands of lives. She worked to promote human and civil rights. She was involved in more than 30 major political campaigns and organizations. Her influence on the younger generation of activists earned her the nickname Fundy, a Swahili word that means a person who teaches a craft to the next generation. Ella Josephine Baker, sometimes called Ella Jo, was born on December 13, 1903 in, Mount, in Norfolk, Virginia. She was raised in North Carolina, and her mother was an important influence on Baker. She taught her daughter the importance of an education, of helping people, and of being a strong woman. Baker carried these lessons with her throughout her life. Baker was an excellent student and graduated from Shaw University at the top of her class in 1927. In 1940, she joined the staff of the NAACP. She eventually served as national director of the NAACP's various branches. In 1957, she met with a group of Southern Black ministers and helped from the Southern Christian leadership conference. SCLC. Martin Luther King Jr. served as the SCLC's first president and Baker was its director. Her work with the SCLC's with the SCLC included running a voter registration campaign called the Crusade for Citizenship. Baker left 
the SCLC in 1960 to help student leaders organize the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee, SNCC. She helped the SNCC become one of the leading voices for human rights in the country. In order to see where we are going, we not only must remember where we have been, but we must understand where we have been. Ella Baker. Listen, are you as excited as I am? I mean, I feel like I have just been downloaded with so much information that I want to go out and start a business. I, I want to run for Congress. I, I want to do something. I, I want to be a king in West Africa. I, I don't know about you, but I have been blessed by this time we spent today. And look at our young people. Aren't they brilliant? Aren't they amazing? Listen, the next time you see them, would you let them know how proud we are? This has been an extremely, an extremely good, wonderful, extravagant, can I give you another adjective? Stupendous Black History Program. And so I hope you have been blessed as much as I have. All we got left now is for Javez Sharp to lead us in prayer and close us out. Listen, I'm thankful that you joined us. If you know somebody, some young person who need to hear this, who need to be a part of this, would you share this with them? Send them the link. Send them the YouTube link. Tell them to get on Facebook. Actually, most young people, they just Instagram and Snapchat. So you're going to have to click that YouTube link and send it to them that way. But make sure they get this information. A mind is a terrible thing to waste. And we have to make sure that our young people have their minds sharpened and they know just how important they are to culture and to the entire world. Thank you for being with us tonight. I'm going to turn it over to Javez. He's going to close in prayer.